The French government has said that its troops stationed to the south of Libya are ready to strike insurgent fighters along the border. However, the Speaker of Libya's parliament has rejected any Western military intervention. Speaking at a meeting of the Arab League in Cairo, the Speaker of the internationally recognized Libyan parliament called on the Arab League to intervene after an escalation of violence in the war-torn state. <laughs> Three years after the fall of the Gaddafi regime, Libya is mired in a power struggle between two rival factions of former rebels who have established competing governments, with both claiming legitimacy and control over the country's resources. Most foreign governments have pulled out their diplomats after weeks of fighting in Tripoli between the competing factions. Nathaniel Lema Sansom, The Report. Well, to discuss that Libyan story that we just saw, I'm now joined in the studio by James Schneider, who's editorial director of the New African magazine. James, welcome to the show. Um, so the French have offered troops, but that offer has been um, turned down. Um, what's been happening there? Why did they make the offer and why was it turned down? They've not quite offered troops. What they've said is they've, they're building a new sort of counter-terror base in the north of Niger, which is where the border with Libya is. And they said that they're prepared to use the drone base that they're developing there to um, uh, hit militants who are crossing the border. They've not offered, they've explicitly not offered to go it alone and go in and offer further, su uh, further support. Uh, you know, Alon said that explicitly earlier. Um, the, uh, the Tobruk government, the one that's internationally recognised, has been calling for you know, some kind of international support, but it doesn't want to seem like it's totally reliant on international support because its control over the country is extremely tenuous and they don't want to give um, sort of uh, extra uh, points to the other side why they seem like they're being imposed from the outside. So they've asked for the Arab League, which is a much more kind of legitimate institution or seems a more legitimate institution to help. But that is, doesn't run contradictory to France still having some kind of operations on the border, because that's quite distinct from France engaging in operations in Tripoli. Because we have to remember there has been foreign military intervention in this, um, uh, in this sort of civil war taking place between the two sides that claim to be the legitimate government, where Egypt and the UAE have taken the side of the Tobruk government versus the Tripoli government. So, so what the Tobruk government is asking for um, from the Arab League is a kind of extension of what the Egyptians and the UAE have already been doing then. Is, would that be right? Yes, they want more help against what they're calling, I mean, it, and it's, it's wrong to say that that's just what they are, but what they're calling the sort of terrorist government of Tripoli, they want uh, you know, additional support. And they're also supporting uh, Khalifa Hiftar, the, you know, he's often described as the renegade general who rose up with Gaddafi and then was um, cast off by Gaddafi in the late 80s and came and was one of the main commanders of the, of the rebel forces during the, during the revolution, who is doing his sort of one man, uh, not through any legitimate channels, but endorsed by the Tobruk government uh, campaign against um, what he calls jihadi elements, main, especially in Benghazi, but also in Tripoli. So how much territory does the Tobruk government actually control within not, the country? Not very much. And this is the, so th this is the problem. Uh, for them, although they're recognised by the international community. They're not recognised uh, by so many Libyans. They're not recognised by so many Libyans and only about the turnout for the election that voted for them was only about 18 percent in their whole parts of the country where the vote didn't take place, which is why this sort of rubber stamp of legitimacy which they're given by international community because they were elected doesn't hold water for a large number of Libyans. This is really the heart of the problem. It's not that there's uh, one illegitimate force which has seized power in Tripoli, it's that there's no uh, legitimate force that um, is able to kind of uh, get control of of state power. So there are longer standing divisions within Libya. It is like many countries, uh, an amalgam of different areas and uh, uh, and loyalties. Um, is is that breaking down as a nation state now? Um, I mean, at the moment, it it has. It, you know, it has rather completely. I mean, it, what has what has taken place is that the different militia groups that um, were generally regionally organised, uh, rather than ideologically organised, that rose uh, up during the revolution and allied together, didn't uh, didn't disarm at the end of the revolution. They wanted to seek the best possible deal. You could either argue for their region if they if you're being sort of more generous to them, or for themselves and the people they're fighting for the terms of their integration. 
And the way in which it was generally done was that their salaries will be, they get to stay in their units, their salaries will be paid by a central government, but, and there will be some future integration process, but it was kicked, you know, kicked into the future. And the problem with that is it incentivized the militias to stay as militias with their own separate command structures and highly regionalized. And then these have been able to be used uh, to, to keep the country separate rather than bringing it together. Mm. And how much, I mean, this, this was held up, if we remember, as the, uh, as the success story of Western intervention. Cameron was in Tripoli and all the, and all the rest of it immediately after Gaddafi fell. Um, but how much did that intervention shape this outcome? Would it, for instance, have been um, more likely that the um, the movement against um, Gaddafi became more politically consolidated, more homogeneous, if it had to fight on its own terms and not had that huge Western air operation. Well, he's, Cameron's very quiet about it now, and I mean, I think that if you're going to say that you've done something fantastic, you should bear some responsibility for when it turns sour. I, I don't think you can necessarily, I mean it doesn't mean that that wouldn't be the case, but I don't think you can necessarily say without um, uh, NATO air in, uh, intervention that you would have got a kind of more homogenous uh, revolutionary uh, force because you've got to remember that um, the militias were not just being armed by uh, Western means, they were getting uh, arms from Qatar and elsewhere, which was stoking um, the this uh, regional militia uh, mm. element. So, you, I mean, the, the way in which the West has dealt with Libya since the, since the fall of Gaddafi and the way in which it helped the fall of Gaddafi has uh, you know, con contributed to the current situation. But it's not as if there's no Libyan or also other Arab state agency in it as well. Mm -hmm. And finally, what's likely to be the outcome here? I mean, it sounds as if the Tobruk government is, is hanging on by a thread, really. It, ab it absolutely is. Um, and it's still receiving support in this, I'm afraid, for, uh, you know, violence is going to is going to carry on. They they keep trying to characterise it as being about uh, you know against Islamists, the secularists against Islamists, but it's not. It, it's actually significantly more complicated than that. There are a huge number of different militant groups with different uh, interests, which sometimes ally with each other and sometimes break with each other. And really, unless uh, there's some process that can start to bring those elements together a lot without too much interference from different external forces who have effectively fighting sort of proxy wars through uh, Libya, then it's difficult to see how the violence can stop in some kind of you know, hopeful future that people really wanted when the, the original uprising against Gaddafi happened could continue. Well, of course, we've seen this, the, the element of a proxy war, as you describe it, very markedly in, in Syria and, and the Tobruk government, as you say, has the, the backing of the West. Who else is interfering and, and who are they supporting? Well, the Tobruk government also has the support of the UAE and Egypt, the anti-Muslim Brotherhood forces, mm. who are actually probably playing a significantly larger role than the, than, West. Than the West are, even though you know, the West line up alongside them, versus uh, Qatar and to a lesser extent Turkey who support the, the more Muslim Brotherhood aligned forces who also currently are allied with Misrata, so the, which is the third biggest city in Libya, who are lined up with the Muslim Brotherhood forces who have, those are the ones that have taken control of the former parliamentary body, which is in Tripoli. They, that body basically didn't recognize the election that has led to the Tobruk government. And then the Misrata militia and some Muslim Brotherhood um, representatives came in and did a sort of purge of the parliament and to only have more Islamist inclined and Misrata inclined forces. And so are those cohering? And, and, is, and is their coherence uh, a necessary um, element in them uh, overcoming the Tobruk government? They are, they are keeping together because they're being fought together. They're being presented as both being these kind of you know, radical Islamist forces. But even then, there is those who are allied with the, with the Muslim Brotherhood or other um, parties that follow some form of political Islam often are many, many miles away from the Ansar al-Sharia forces that are being fought against in Benghazi. So there are these, uh, these alliances keep together as, as long as they're being attacked, but they don't have a kind of uh, a long-standing structural reason why they would necessarily be together. But that doesn't mean they have to be antagonistic. They're just two different elements within the whole equation that need to be worked out. Okay, James Schneider, thanks very much for that. But I'm afraid we'll have to end that uh, item just there. And uh, before we take a final break, we're going to have a look at what you've been saying on Twitter. Uh, London-based journalist Nadine Marushi tweets on the seeming parody of politics that's taking place in Egypt. She tweets, Egypt's foreign ministry has just sent foreign journos a note reminding us to report accurate news 
Otherwise, it ruins Egypt's image abroad. I think Nadine is suggesting that the regime might be doing a good enough job on its own of ruining the image of Egypt abroad. Staying with Egypt, though, on the eve of the Coptic Christmas, the masked gunmen have shot dead two Egyptian policemen who were on patrol early this morning. The policemen are responsible for the security of a church in Mina, which is a city in the south of Cairo that's the scene of unrest last year when the Coptic Christian community faced several attacks. At Dina, HSN reminds us that Egypt's Coptic minorities' problems should not be swept under the rug. Sirej Detu, UK political reporter at BuzzFeed News, this morning tweeted, I hope that your morning is starting better than the guy who's been kept in immigration detention centres for nearly five years. He's referring to the shocking government figures released under a Freedom of Information Act, which reveals that some individuals have spent almost half a decade of their life detained inside such institutions, awaiting the result of their asylum application effectively locking immigrants up indefinitely for years without trial. And finally, after news that nursery school staff and registered childminders must report toddlers at risk of becoming terrorists under new counter-terrorism measures proposed by the government, North Hans Prevents tweets, The idea of toddlers as terrorists is ridiculous and nurseries are clearly not hotbeds of radicalisation. Meanwhile, the hashtag signs of a radical baby has made a comedic comeback. At Abdul XYZ tweets, Teachers, watch out for any toddlers laughing during class sing-alongs of London Bridges falling down. Hashtag toddler terror. Hashtag signs of a radical baby. Well, uh, we'll have to take a break now, but do rejoin us when we'll be looking at the situation in the Central African Republic a year on from the deadly battle in the capital, Bangui. More on that after this break.